Welcome to Tales of Britain and Ireland. This is a podcast telling the stories, legends and folk tales of Britain and Ireland in no particular order. Presented by Graham and coming direct from South Yorkshire, each episode tells a story or selection of stories from all across these islands and throughout their history, followed by a short and decidedly inexpert discussion of the origin and themes of each tale. Today we have a seasonal bonus episode for you. This was done in rather a hurry, so it's a little bit shorter than usual. Hopefully you'll forgive me, but what I won't do is mess around at the start. So, without any further ado, I present to you... The Trow's Christmas. It was the night before Christmas in an underground house. The creatures were stirring. Those creatures called trows. No, that doesn't quite work, does it? It does in my head, but it's just not a close enough rhyme. But nevertheless, it was the night before Christmas, and the trows were stirring. We're in either Orkney or Shetland, one of the two archipelagos off the north-east coast of Scotland. I'll save a proper introduction to these places for a full episode, so as not to take up too much time now, But just to give you the basics, these island groups have a somewhat unique flavour in the British Isles. One might be tempted to describe them as remote, but really remoteness depends on your perspective, and today they are a centre of a massive energy industry, while they have a past that stretches back almost nine millennia, and much evidence of this earliest habitation remains even to this day. In the intervening time they've played a critical role, positioned as they are between Scotland and Scandinavia, the culture of the islands blending those influences. They even used to have their own language, Norn, which sadly became extinct in the 19th century and is very much not the name of a race from Star Trek. Now, some listeners might already be getting a little huffy that I'm linking the two so closely together, and they are certainly distinct, different cultures. But one thing that they do share, critically for this episode, are trows. And trows, trows love Christmas. Or at least they love Yule, though by the time this story takes place, the two midwinter solstice festivals have already kind of merged into one. I doubt I need to go into the distinction between the two for listeners of this podcast. As a more successful and far better produced podcaster puts it, Yule is a part of the old celebrations, while Christmas... Well, that's your standard Christian celebration. Now, in many other places, this fusing of the two festivals resulted in Yule... Well, let's say that Yule was as unto a male anglerfish who has met a mate, and over time his body has shrunken and dissipated until he has become reduced to nought but a pair of testicles, or in this case a burning log, in the body of the Christmas female anglerfish. I hope you're with me with that metaphor. However, in Orkney and Shetland it was not so, for in these islands Yule remained the primary celebration, with Christmas not quite so diminished as Yule was elsewhere, but still the embarrassing cousin, the fifth beetle. But whatever the celebration was called, the Trows notoriously adored it. But wait, what exactly are these Yule-loving Trows, you might be asking? And you might be imagining they're likely to be jolly, fun-loving, friendly folk. Perhaps they're the claymation stars of some cutesy post-Queen speech 45-minute Christmas children's TV special that you can put on in order to distract the children while you digest that roast and nod off with a glass of sherry feeling fittingly festive. But the trows weren't like that at all. They lived in the little grassy hillocks that abound on the islands which are delightfully known as trowy nows. Suitably twee, whimsical, and kind of adorable, you might think. But the trows themselves were wretched, miserable creatures, and where they interacted with humanity, they seemed most intent on causing harm. Numerous were the ills ascribed to their malevolence. Their breath could paralyse, their touch madden, and what they were reputed to do to infants doesn't bear repeating. 
all the islanders learn from an early age of the protective charms and blessings required to keep the trows distant. They understood the value of carrying an iron knife when travelling in the places the trows would frequent, and woe did often betide those who ignored such precautions. Despite this, there were lots of aspects to the trows that could be interpreted as contrary to such a nasty, dark nature. Though more properly, it is to be said that they, like our own species, contained multitudes. For on occasion the trows could be heard singing tunes both beautiful and merry, and it was not unknown for a canny musician to take a trow tune and pass it off as their own. And of course, the trows loved Yule. They loved the lights and the merriment and the dancing and the feasting, the games, the sports, the carousing, the whole general jollyment of it. But above everything else, they loved that little clause. The little clause in whatever magical rule book demarcated the do's and don'ts of the trow's existence that stated that seven days before Yule, on Tullius Eve, they were allowed to move freely between their underground homes and the overworld of humans. It's not unusual at solstice time for the veil between the worlds to be lifted a little. And perhaps it was the result of such a weakening between the walls of the worlds that the trowers were allowed a much freer reign than they were for the rest of the year. And not just on Tullius night, but for many days of Yule after. And so Yule in the islands, for all its good fun times in the darkness of winter, came with a hidden barb for the human inhabitants. And while they made their preparations, sewed their new clothes, cooked sumptuous foods, hung decorations, planned gatherings, they also had to take care to take keen precautions, seining, as the magical or holy protection that was gained from making the sign of the cross was called. On Tullius Eve, the people would take pieces of straw and lay them in crosses on the walls. A hair was to be plucked from each cow and horse, plaited together and fastened over the barn door, so to keep the sickness of the trows away from the life-giving livestock. Other rituals too would be conducted at this time of the trows rampaging. A blazing cut of peat was carried through all the outbuildings of the farm, as a form of preventative supernatural fumigation. And when all this saning was done, the rest of the preparations could continue. Though repeating the signs of the cross and offering the odd prayer to Mary was no bad idea throughout the entire period. And on Yule Eve, a whole other set of rituals were necessary. When all the cooking was done, everyone in the house would wash, and into the bathing water three hot coals would be dropped. Every person was given a clean, ideally new, garment to wear in which they would sleep that night. The house was meticulously tidied. And then, somewhat counterintuitively, all locks were to be left open, a lamp was left burning, and most importantly of all, an iron blade was laid on a table close to the door. Then everyone could go safely to bed, and in the morning, it would be Yule. And so, with that background, we're back to just about where we began. We're going to attempt that rhyme again. T'was the night before Christmas, and creeping into the house came those hill-dwelling creatures, the grey ones, the trows. The children were nestled all snug in their beds, while visions of yule cakes filled their young heads. Infants asleep, the parents had taken their chance, and they'd hurried next door to join in with a dance. In their haste, well, the seining, clear slipped their mind, and the children they'd left unprotected behind. The trows made their way in and soon found the bed, and what happened next there should fill you with dread. They spoke not a word, but went straight to their work. They saw to the children, 
then turned with a jerk. They'd done what they came for, so left the sad room. For they'd places to go now. Out they slipped into the gloom. Now next door's dancing was not just a little boogie in the parlour. This was a rural community, it was you leave, and this was a full-on barn which had been cleared for the event. Anyone who was anyone was there. Fiddlers were leading the dancers, couples were swinging each other round and dozy doing and gay gardening and, well, actually probably not those exact moves, but I'm trying to build a picture here. This was a full-on shindig, Kaylee, hootenanny type affair. Busy and bustling. And it was into all of this that the children quietly glided. The two lads were aged three and five years old. But even in an era where childhoods were much truncated from today's many leisurely years, the lads were still quite young. And as they made their way into the barn, those closest to the door who noticed their arrival responded with slightly intoxicated amusement. Oh, you've come to join in? And as the fiddler started up his next tune, and the boys started to dance along, well, there was a chorus of, Oh, look at them dancing, aren't they just adorable? Accompanied by generous laughter. Go on, boys, give it your best, said an old fisherman. And the boys did just that. And as the reel began, the small pair danced in earnest, and with exceptional timing, their feet keeping perfectly to the rhythm of the fiddle. You're doing damn fine, encouraged the fisherman, and as the music quickened, he became more and more impressed that two so young could physically keep up with its demands, and as the tune became more fast and furious, the dancing of the two became ever faster with it. And at the very height of the reel, their mother, who was dancing in another set, suddenly spied her boys whirling around with supernatural speed, and she screamed. The dancing came to a sudden and immediate stop. No recorded music here. The fiddler simply stopped playing at the sound of the cry, and within seconds the whole room was plunged into confusion as the music stopped and the mother ran towards her children. Her children standing so still, and their eyes. It occurred to a few of the watchers that their eyes were oddly widely open. Had they actually blinked? as they danced. Did it seem like, perhaps, they didn't know that they should be blinking? God save me, my parents! cried the mother as she ran. And no sooner was the Lord's name out of her lips than the forms of her children were recoiling in horror, for no trow can bear the power of the divine. And they were off, slipping between the legs of the people in the hushed crowd and out into the night. The mother pushed through desperately to the door. To lighten the tension, a few folks started to joke. Calm down, dear. It's only a commercial. Look, the tykes were just enjoying themselves. No, I, I put them to bed. Why would they come here? They'd never leave the house. For the more knowledgeable of those who had witnessed the dancing, the memory of the past few minutes quickly began to take on a much darker hue. Well, whatever the matter of it, the little lambs will be cold out there, said an old woman. Yes, yes, of course. And the mother hurried out, her husband quick behind her. They went first to their house. But the children were not in their beds or the parlour. They were not in any of the outhouses either. Distraught, the mother emerged outside to an assembled expectant party. They're gone, she exclaimed. And in an instant, an icy seriousness washed over the revellers, draining all joy, jolting them into a painful sobriety. A rush of focused activity commenced at once. Some headed to neighbours to see if the children had gone there. Others lit torches, picked up iron knives, wrapped themselves in warm clothes, before forming search parties that headed off into the biting cold and darkness of the Yule evening, saning themselves as they went. At some point during all this frenetic activity, someone, 
Someone who remembered the way the children had danced and the look in their eyes. Asked the parents outright. You did the seinen before you left them, right? We, we forgot, came the terrified response. Grim looks were exchanged and heads were shaken sadly. Though the search continued with the same energy, it was with heavier hearts. For they knew then that it was the trows that had taken the form of the boys. As the night went on, little white snowflakes began to appear in the air. And by the early Yule morning, the whole island was covered in a soft, freezing blanket. Their worst fears were confirmed a few hours later, when the bodies of the two boys were found in a ravine, arms wrapped round one another, almost buried under the snow. The trowers that had inhabited them were nowhere to be seen. And that was that. Though there were still many more weeks when the presence of the trowers could be felt, and on that island in that year, none would forget the seining again. But it was not until after twenty-fourth night, when those magical laws once again ordained that the unwelcome grey folk must once again leave the dwellings of men and descend beneath the earth. And when that day was finally reached, the people of the island gave an especially heartfelt thanks for the departure of the creatures. But the trowers, though, oh, they loved you all. And this year, this year had been very exciting. They'd enjoyed a very merry time indeed. And there would always be a next year. And as the last of the trowers crawled back into their mounds, it was heard to exclaim, as it disappeared out of sight, A merry yule to you all, and to all, a good night. And that's it. I said it was short. Apologies for all the dog roll rhyming going on there, and indeed for the minuscule length of this episode. Also, this is the fastest I've ever made one of these, throwing it all together in a few hours, so apologies for any problems that may have crept into it because of that. Now, because of the reasons I've just mentioned, there isn't a discussion section here, and I'm likely to talk about the Trows, Shetland and Orkney all in the future, so... I thought I'd leave it off for now and we'll come back round to it at some other point. But before I sign off, I'd just like to take the opportunity to give my heartfelt thanks to everyone who has engaged with the podcast this year. Everyone who has supported it on Patreon or left a review or, well, simply listened and enjoyed. Thank you for sticking with my inelegant musical transitions, abysmal release schedule and my struggles to pronounce any word beginning with TH. It really does mean a hell of a lot to me. Many more episodes will be coming, hopefully thick, there we go again, and fast in the new year, including a third Patreon members episode of about this length, which also features an Orkney legend. And for those of you listening around the festive season at the end of 2020, well, it might by now be cliché to say that it's been a bloody strange, difficult, and for some tragic year, but that doesn't change the reality of it, so I'm saying it again now. I'm not one to presume that the day is getting longer, or the new year portends to nascent happiness, health and success to all. The vicissitudes of fate are far more complex than that, and, like every year, this one will bring its share of tidings both good and ill, but never fairly distributed. But despite that, I would like to wish you, whoever you are and wherever you are, All the best for now and the future, and hope that, in amongst it all, there are some pleasant times for you ahead. If you are not listening in 2020, but sometime in the future, well, it may seem in vain, and you'll know, but I hope things are good there. And I hope that, in good time, I'm able to join you. Ah, okay, that's really it. Next time on the podcast, we will look at a story from Northumberland, with a setting that's taken right from a 1970s hair metal fantasy musical. 
You can follow Tales of Britain and Ireland podcast on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. There's also a website, talesofbritainandireland.com, where there's a page for each episode which contains more information, including illustrations, asides and recaps, along with other additional bits and pieces to explore. The intro music was written and performed by Alice Nichols, and you can find all the other musical credits on the episode page on the website. If you enjoyed this podcast, then please do share it with others or give it a review, as those really are the best ways to help us out. You can also join Tales of Britain and Ireland on Patreon to get extra members' episodes. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you'll join me again soon.